Well, welcome to this week. Uh, my name is Joe Sims. Hey, Scott Hiley. Hey, Joe. How's it going? Good morning, Revolution. That's, Good morning, Revolution. That's going to be my standard way to start this uh, program. <laughs> By the way, before we get started, well, <clears throat> let me take off my brim. Um, we want to invite everybody to start, how do you call that? Start a meeting? Start a invite people to? Oh, yeah, start a watch party. So a watch watch party. This window, yeah, there's a little well, watch party button. You can share this with your friends, guys. Um, all you got to do is click on the button on the bottom of the, um, of the, uh, Facebook uh, page, <clears throat> not the page, but the items oh, yeah. to stream that you're watching. Click on start a watch party and you can share this with your uh, friends. You can even choose who you'd like to see it. Don't hide our light under a bushel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Scott, um, speaking of, uh, of uh, revolution, um, do you think we're on the verge of one? Because we talked about this great socialist moment that we're in now and the merging of the all peoples and the anti-monopoly stage. If that's well, what's actually happening, I'm not sure about that. Depends on what you mean by, by verge and, and what you mean by revolution, I think. Um, so uh, we are, there, there are periods when revolution is possible or more likely in periods when it's less likely hmm. We're in a period where big change is not only happening it's, it's sort of recognized and desired by masses of people um, it is a period that has i would say a certain revolutionary potential um, but are, are is capitalism going to be overthrown tomorrow um, that's a question of the strength and, and organization of the working class and and its allies and i don't think we're quite there but you feel that the revolutionary part of our agenda is not as um, uh, pronounced as it might be, or that we might be, you know, uh, losing sight of it in favor of a more gradualistic uh, evolutionary I think, path. I don't think that's the case. However, I think that sometimes our way of presenting um, our thinking doesn't emphasize its revolutionary nature enough, mm. right? So we, we've, we've never adopted a, a gradualist or, or reformist approach saying that, you know, first we, you know, win this thing and then the next this thing. And eventually, you know, we have socialism. That's not how we see it. Um, when we fight for these uh, democratic reforms, the gains we can make under capitalism, what we're doing is building the power of the working class and its organization and, and uh, to enable us to um, to make that revolutionary break. So, um, and I think sometimes that, yeah, we don't emphasize that, you know, we don't, we, we are revolutionaries. We don't see capitalism and socialism as compatible. Uh, we don't see like, you know, a step-by-step -step gradual road from one to the other. Uh, there is a break that happens. It might not be over the course of a week, um, but it's also not, you know, gradual change. Well, let me ask you this, even Bernie Sanders calls himself a revolutionary and he's calling for a political revolution. So we, we, we uh, there is that uh, element that's been put out there and it seems that a lot of people are gravitating to it. Ab absolutely. Um, when I went to the Women's March, um, it wasn't this past uh, winter, it was the one before, I was up in Seneca Falls and there were like there was a, a sentiment there and a, an open demand uh you know in terms of revolution um women and of men who were allied with them saying that the overthrow of the patriarchy or the you know the equality for women would be a revolutionary step would be a huge change um you know there are different ways of understanding that term uh but there is a sense, I think, broadly, that big change is on the horizon and people are welcoming it. Well, I mean, it would be, you know, quite, quite um, significant, revolutionary even. I mean, the elimination of the wage differential. Yeah. Men and women, man, that would be huge. Well, and the, the elimination of the wage differential, the 
elimination of of the um, you know underrepresentation of women in positions of of political and economic power the you know taking off the table once and for all the the you know this idea that men should have control over women's lives and bodies and reproductive choices that's that's that would be enormous yes well let me ask you another question let me approach it this way the people's world had a interesting article the other day saying that bernie sanders is calling for workers control of the means of production and uh, when you read the article, which was written by Mark Groenberg, it's an it's it's excellent uh, portrayal mm -hmm. of what's being put forward. They're calling for the creation of uh, funds uh, that mm -hmm. would um, enable, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me, funds that would en enable workers to buy controlling shares in corporations. That's one side of the proposal. Mm -hmm. The other one is that workers should sit on corporate boards. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's revolutionary? Again, it depends on what you what you mean by the term. It's a revolution, to my mind, um, if we think about Marxist revolution, socialist revolution, it means um, the the working class seizing the power that is currently held by the capitalist class and using it for its own benefit. Um, is this proposal going to accomplish that task in its entirety? I don't, I don't think so. Is it certainly a, a concrete step toward it, uh, a, a forum in which the working class will hold and wield a much greater measure of power than it does now and, and learn to use that? Absolutely. So I guess my whole approach to this, this Bernie question is, that all of these things are great, you know, trying to, to build this socialist, these socialist institutions within capitalism, um, it can move us forward. But as we've seen, they can't survive long-term. There's no, as long as the capitalist class holds power, as long as the basic structure of society is the division between um, an exploiting class and a working class. So what you're saying is that there's kind of they're like kind of utopian uh, schemes, like setting up these little communes uh, that were done in the '60s and '70s here. No, I wouldn't see it as utopian. I would see it as more like um, like uh, the labor movement in a certain sense. You know, the labor movement exists within capitalism, but it exists as a way of workers. Um, gaining a measure of power, admittedly a small one, and, and using that power, learning to use that power in a way that advances the class as a whole. It, it's a, it was a huge step forward. It is not in itself a socialist revolution, but it's part of the preparation for it. Well, I kind of think that they're utopian schemes in the sense that they um, are not premised on the and I think I agree with you in this sense that they did not premised on the uh, on the notion of working class control, ownership, and distribution of uh, of, of property. You know, mm -hmm. um, not property in general, but the private property of the big corporations. Yeah. You know, if you're a small business, okay, I'm not going to argue with you about that, even a medium-sized one. But the big businesses. And the big banks, you know. Yeah, yeah, the Wells Fargo's and Amazon's and and yeah, the uh, Chase Manhattan and you know all of these. Uh, so, uh, AT and T, you mm -hmm. know, T Mobile, the, ph the pharma companies, you know, exactly. You know, they need to be in working class uh, hands, but you know, uh, in order to get there, we gotta defeat the Trump administration, and people are calling more and more for impeachment. Mr. Mueller got on TV the other day, and he basically gave a big nod to the Democratic Party uh, and the House of Representatives saying that I can't, I'm constitutionally prohibited from dealing with this, so the ball is in you guys' court. Um, 
I thought that was a uh... well, and and in addition, he said uh, basically, if there was no grounds for criminal charges against him, we would have said so. Right. Uh, and we didn't say so. And we didn't say so. Bad as hell. Oh. And we we, we got to emphasize like in, impeachment. You know, we there's this. I think. I don't know myth around around Mueller that that you know he's the the one leading this drive that he's the the crusader who's going to no the impeachment is a popular demand if if the Mueller cannot well, save us <laughs> yeah if people are if people haven't hadn't been in the streets and on social media calling for you know the end of this criminal corrupt uh regime then you know, this report would not be taking the direction that it But has. the fear is that given the partisan strife in the country and the deep divisions that impeachment would further divide it and create the basis for social unrest on the right. And, you know, it might even jeopardize the uh, next election uh, to say nothing of uh, whether or not Trump would use it as a badge of honor saying, I've been impeached in the House, I've tried in the Senate. Senate said, you're not guilty. No you're collusion. Not, <laughs> no collusion and I'm free and I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. And um, let's fight against this Democratic Party leftist socialist coup d'etat. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's always a danger. I think there is, you know, uh, aside from the, you know, the huge masses of people that that oppose the Trump regime, mm. uh, even in in sort of ruling class and elite circles, there's a real concern with with legitimacy, like preserving uh, legitimacy. And if he's impeached, um, I think you're you know you're going to see more and more uh, forces on that and turning even within the Republican Party uh, turning against him. Um, It'd be a great act of public education. It would, uh, and uh, that's 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 the important, you know, part of it. Already, the fact that he's he's being um, challenged in the Republican primary uh, is is a big deal, right? Uh, which is right. not usual for a sitting president. Now, the Attorney General got on TV last night on CBS. He was in Alaska. And he said, you know, I have to say that I do not think that President Trump uh, has been undermining institutions. In fact, the people who are undermining institutions are these goddamn Democrats. He didn't say goddamn, but <laughs> I think that's what he meant, who are saying we must resist, we must, re we must resist. And yeah. this whole call for resistance is undermining a democratically elected president. <laughs> So if there's a problem with undermining a public institution, it's you guys who are doing it. Well, this whole this whole question of public institutions and and like protecting our institutions is is a little bit it's utopian in a certain sense. Like there's this idea that it, that the institutions are there and they're going to protect us and 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 whatever. Like what we've seen over the past, really since 2008. Um, in a sense, even longer than that, is that the institutions are incapable of preventing the rise of the forces that that will destroy them. Right? You know, the the sort of centrist section of the ruling class loves to talk about, oh, you know, we need to preserve democracy, we need to preserve our institutions, but those institutions presided over the rise of all of these far right extreme nationalist neo fascist forces like they it's, it's like we've said many times Did they preside over them or were they used by corporate right wing forces who understand their use and who have dominated them and use them to their well right i mean, I mean institutions that are i mean i would say that institutions that are based on their class you know, capitalist class power yeah. can't rein in that section of the capitalist class. Like, yeah. thus the need for, you know, a, a revolutionary transformation of, of yeah, our political. That also means a very broad and very deep struggle for democracy because yes. you know, without people's power, without pressure from below, 
you know, the pressure will just come from the right and uh, that's the way the country will go. Mm -hmm. you know? But I thought that um, the Attorney General Barr's statement was really revealing from, and it made crystal clear the, the, the class point of view with respect to the notions of resistance and anti-resistance, you know? Yeah. From their point of view, the forces that are undermining the uh, capitalist state uh, are the people who are fighting for democracy. Mm. Yeah. From our point of view, the people who are uh, undermining the uh, democracy are those who are dominating the, the capitalist state. Exactly, exactly. And never the twain shall meet, you know what I mean? And this is, and that's, and that's becoming, I think that's the, the thing that people are, that's coming to kind of mass consciousness right now is that um, the democracy and capitalism are incompatible, that, you know, we've reached a point where um, it's very clear that this uh, extremist, uh, you know, reactionary fascist section of the capitalist class is actually, you know, doing, th they're, they're, you know, even capitalist democracy is not enough for them. Um, and that if we want real democracy, we have to move beyond them and beyond capitalism as a whole. I think I want to debate that issue a little bit with you next week, that capitalism and democracy are, are incompatible. Um, but let's wait till next week. Right now, I want to know, uh, because I think that long term they are, you know, but at the same time, you know, there is and has been room within capitalism to fight for democracy. And yes. If that were not the case, you know, we would, you know, not be able to have this program. No, that's very true. Um, but speaking of democracy, we're almost on the verge of the party's 31st convention, which will be a great exercise in working class uh, democracy. Uh, what are some of the things that are before us right now in terms of deadlines? Um, and uh, what should be, be people be looking for at the convention? Uh, so in terms of deadlines, uh, today is the last day to submit a piece for uh, pre-convention discussion. Oh no, I gotta start writing. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, you can send your, your pieces to discussion at cpusa.org. Um, they can be uh, video or written. Um, it's also, uh, uh, the resolutions committee has published the set of resolutions, there are 26 of them, that will be considered at the convention, voted on at the convention. Um, the window is now open for proposing amendments to those. Uh, the deadline to propose amendments is this Sunday, June 2nd at 5 p.m. Eastern. So uh, take a look at them. Uh, in particular, the first three resolutions on the list are um, what we're calling resolutions for workshops of the whole, mm. uh, meaning that there will be plenary sessions of the convention um, to uh, look over, talk through these resolutions, um, and uh, hopefully adopt them. Um, uh, there's and what, one. And on, what do those resolutions deal with? Can you? Do you well, there's one on um, the relationship. I believe the relationship of class struggle to uh, other fights for equality. That's um, an important one. Okay. There's one on the Green New Deal and the ecological crisis. The and there's Green one Green. on demilitarization and the peace economy. Peace economy. I yes. think I'm not sure if that's the word they use, but uh, um, uh, sort of the the economic importance of demilitarization. Okay, all right. So please get your pre-convention discussion in. Um, and uh, if you, excuse me, wanna make amendments to um, these resolutions, Sunday at five is the deadline. So I got a lot of writing to do between now and now. And yeah, I got a lot of reading to do. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the resolutions documents like 42 pages long, so. Oh my God, 42 pages. Yeah, some of the resolutions are, are lengthy. Golly, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna have the convention and then what? Uh, have, has, have, have you 
giving any thoughts to like what are the main, what's the party going to look like in the period after the convention, and what are some of the main issues that uh, we really want to be dealing with? I think the party is going to look a lot like it does now. I, I, you know, I think that the past few years there's been a lot of amazing work done. Um, we've been growing. Uh, people are are coming to us. Unfortunately, we haven't always been able to. Um, engage them in the work, bring them in, stay in contact with them to the degree that we'd like. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, we did a membership survey and already 400 have come in. Wow. Good responses. And 300 of those 400 uh, are people who have been in the party for less than five years. And, and we, so that's, that's what I think is, you know, the need is, and that's where we're going to move is, you know, not just what needs to be done, but how do we bring all of these new people into the work, give them um, the opportunity to, to, you know, help with the work of the party, uh, to contribute to our um, to our website, to the people's world, to um, you know whatever whatever their talents are. Um, so take, that, ownership. Take, take ownership. Take ownership. This is this is your party. This is their party. This is this is, and uh, so that's going to be a, a big big uh, issue. And, uh, and that's you, you're on the membership and in uh, membership engagement and organizing committee, right? Indeed, I am. Um, so I, I know that I heard a report from uh, you guys the other night at the national board meeting. It was the amount of work that's already been done and the initiatives you have in store are pretty exciting, so. Well, yes, and uh, organizing our party to participate in the um, upcoming election, gonna be a big issue uh, coming up, you know. Uh, Hopefully we're not gonna see this the, the same kind of, you know, divisiveness around the primary that we saw in the last round. I think people have, have learned some valuable lessons about, about the day. So, I mean, because we've said that we welcome the Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. candidacy and also yeah. the uh, participation of a number yeah. of outstanding uh, African-American women uh, 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 candidates. And uh, <clears throat> but it looks like Joe Biden is leading the uh, pack so far, but it's still quite early. Mm -hmm. We'll see what uh, happens. Uh, and this is this is this is a normal part of of struggle for for those you know uh, within and, and working through the Democratic Party over the the kind of orientation of, of of that party and and kind of the movement as a whole. So, but I think that the big issue before us will be to involve the party in fighting around the everyday crisis of living that working class people yeah. Face yeah. and and helping to organize and mobilize and take initiative around those issues. Uh, you know, on that, on that, the end of that crisis of life, I was doing some research recently um, and came across an interesting sort of uh, factoid. Um, the head of the, the, the former CEO of, of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, um, I believe it was in 20, 2016 or 2017, the board approved a 61% pay raise for him uh, in the same year that they jacked up the prices on a bunch of their drugs. Mm. Uh, the, 61%? Yeah, to $27.9 million. Um, mm. The rationale was it was an incentive to keep him from retiring. Uh, when, you know, and when I look around me at the, the people I know, the incentive that keeps them from retiring is they can't afford to retire. Mm -hmm. So apparently, you know, there are incentives and incentives. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we mean, the crisis of life for the working class. It's exactly. And uh, so getting involved in that fight, advancing it forward, whatever forms it might be, it might take the f form of the fight against police violence um, or uh, the fight uh, against uh, the drug pushers in your community. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be, um, the fight against plan closings, you know, like in Lordstown, yeah. where I come from originally, or in the Youngstown, Warren area, or it might be the fight for reproductive rights, which, by the way, is a huge issue. And we have memes on our Facebook page and on our party front page. Louisiana has now um, uh, adopted a uh, six-week uh, 
uh, and a ban on a total ban on abortions after yeah, they, they see this as a, a wedge issue and uh, but it's a basic democratic rights issue yep. so we encourage people to go to our Facebook page go to our website take a pledge to fight for a woman's right to choose a woman's because abortion care is health care well I think that does it for us this week yep and uh, we'll be back uh, same time, same station, uh, next Friday. Um, and Scott and I are going to debate whether or not democracy has been exhausted. Under well, uh, man, your words, not mine. <laughs> but yes, we will. Uh, we'll talk about it. Okay, good enough. Have a great weekend. You too. Talk to you later. Say hi to that beautiful little girl of yours. Will do. Bye bye. <laughs>